Definitely get some strange looks in the city work, from the city workers here as we set this up, but the, here's the bottom line. Um, the cops are told to stand down right now, so um, they, they're not going to call the cops for the guy driving all his gear under the sand, so I think we're good to go. We're here in the sand today. You might be wondering why we're in the sand. So for one, we want to bring people a chance something during quarantine because um, a lot of people that watch our videos they're in Australia you know places like that you know Japan you know all these different places that have access to sand Kuwait access to sand all these different places and, and, and sometimes it's not even right in the ocean you have like deserts and stuff that have access to the sand so if you're not able to get to a gym what can we utilize outdoors some people are doing this self to using this time to build themselves like they're becoming you know, like more of a savage during this time. They're building themselves, using this time wisely to come that. Other people, you know, are saying, you know, if I had access to weights, I'd be doing this or that. No, you wouldn't. You'd be playing video games. You'd be holding your sausage hostage. You probably wouldn't even do that because you lost your libido at this point from your low T. So it wouldn't happen. So either you're using this time wisely or not. That's, that's how this is. Okay, so we're gonna, this video is dedicated to people that want to utilize that time because we if you have the if you're already watching this video we know you're going to utilize this time so how can we utilize this time better one of the ways if you've access to sand is training the sand no access to sand you can do what we're doing on a hill okay so why would you use the sand okay so you think about it when you run on a hard surface the ground is like a trampoline you know you put force into the ground it's, it's absorbed by the ground then it's it's shot back at you so it's like a trampoline type of effect the sand absorbs 100 of, of percent of the force applied to it, yet it only it only shoots back a very small percentage of that sand. So if we have sand, it's you know three. Say the sand it's about three feet deep. It was raining here, so that's why we're doing shorter distances and things like that. And it's not as soft as it, it always is. But if it's soft, it stands soft. It's three feet deep. You know, a grown up's gonna a grown up has you know say on average a shoe sole that's about half an inch thick. Okay, so if you, and it sinks about, in that three feet deep sand, when you run, you apply force, you're gonna sink about three inches into the ground. Okay, so the ground, so each of those half inches is like a different level. So you're basically, you have to be resisted by six different levels of sand. That's a crazy overload. And I first learned about this concept when I trained with Matt Poe, the very well-known speed coach in Nashville, Tennessee. We, um, I started working with him. I moved to Tennessee and we train together. You will, you know, think about it. You're required to pull your bo your legs and your body out of six different levels, okay? This requires much more muscular over overload and the metabolic demand is much greater. Some studies show it takes 20 to 60% more energy utilization to sprint in sand versus on a harder surface. So, that you know, you think, why do track coaches not like, a lot of track coaches don't like sand sprinting. I think it makes very good sense what they're saying. Because if you think about you have a Usain Bolt or somebody just beautiful, you know, runner, the perfect cadence, they've worked forever to develop that rhythm. You throw them in this kind of resistance, it may throw off that rhythm. I get that. I'm not Usain Bolt. You're not Usain Bolt. We're people training to be more explosive. So, you know, a tactical athlete, you know what? You're running minimally with 20 to 25 pounds of gear on. If you're a warfighter in Afghanistan, you're averaging 100 pounds of external load. As you go up a mountain, you might have to sprint. If you're on a SWAT team, you're probably averaging about 66 pounds of gear. You know, if you're a structural firefighter, you know, when you have to pull somebody out, you're resistant. So for everybody else, even like team sport, contact sport athletes, the sand can be utilized very efficiently. So another benefit or detriment, depending on how you look at it from a track coach's perspective, is the track is your over time you will even though this causes greater muscular overload you get less sore from it because what it does is it sort of um it, it more minimizes the eccentric forces so if you're a track runner what that could do is potentially maybe not make your stride perfect but for everybody else that lessens the risk of injury because those powerful eccentric contractions a lot of times is where you get injured and then you know since it helps to recover better it's and it's obviously the soft sand is easier on your joints and you know you shouldn't be running concrete anyways but even the grass the soft sand is going to be much easier on your joints the other thing that sand does again this is why i track coachman i like it is um it's going to shorten your stride okay so when your shot stride is shortened 
that's you have less chance of in, injuring your hamstring. So that's why for normal people, especially you powerful people that have these powerful engines and a you know pretty small car that have been training sprints, um, this is going to shorten your stride and make it safer so you don't tear a hamstring. So when you um, this is like okay, so we have the you know hill on one level. This would probably be the next step you know on that hierarchy of the hill is going to be safest. This would be this you know this is going to be great. You're going to be able to move a little bit faster in sand more than likely so that you could do the hill first then the sand but if you're in the hill and you're ready for the sand it's a great way to to go here so um it's going to decrease your velocity so your top speed you're not gonna be quite as fast in the sand again that is safer if you're not a competitive sprinter or you're not you know whatever so the other thing is if you're training the same way all the time so you know the body thrives in our team, but at some point, if something's effective, it is nice to have some variety and novelty into your training port, not do the same thing every time. The issue with that is a lot of people are training for the gram, doing whatever, being acting kind of silly and not getting anything out of it. This is a variety, this is novelty, but it's very, very highly effective. So there's a lot of benefits to sand training, and um, that's why we are training in sand training. The performance benefits of sprinting in the sand, you know, compound movements here, all this stuff are, are pretty obvious. So we're going to talk about that. But we're also going to talk about the anabolic muscle building movements. So here's what we're doing here. So first off, we start off with something that wouldn't be so much of a physique builder, but it's a very good way to start. It's um, do the plate throw overhead and then sprint 20 yards after that. So what the plate throw does from a from a performance standpoint is we've talked before about you, you want to train explosively but you have to do something with triple extension so that's extension of your ankles knees and hips so if all you do is like swings box squats things like that you don't get that you don't actually get that full-on triple extension with the ankles so that's why we're doing that to warm up okay so if all you cared about is aesthetics that you could just view it that and say hey this is not building my physique as much as the other things However, it's providing me a great way to warm up and, you know, the performance benefits. You never know um, when crap's going to hit the fan of the bodybuilding show anyway, so you might need some performance. Okay, so how, can, how, do you build, how do you work fast twitch muscle fibers? That's what we're doing here. This is a fast twitch fiber overload. Okay, there's two ways to work fast twitch muscle fibers. Very heavy weight, you know, so like that's why powerlifters have so much muscle. You have powerlifters that lift really heavy, take long breaks, yet they still pack out a lot of muscles because you see in the lighter weight classes people that you know try train primarily core movements still have a good amount of muscle without doing bodybuilding training it's because they the fast twitch muscle fibers are the ones that have most potential for growth and they work them hard with heavy weight and long rest periods okay um the other way to build fast twitch um, muscle fibers is with explosive movements now you're not going to get the hypertrophy so obviously if all you do is just do really explosive movements with no with the movements unloaded you're not gonna get that same hypertrophy but that is the other way to work fast twitch muscle fibers so i think that's why you look at a lot of sprinters a lot of sprinters go online and look up the ones the 60 meters for the indoor track 100 meters they actually have they a lot of them could actually win a natural bodybuilding contest without having to diet down they are as lean too so there is a lot of benefit here so then we look at people in prisons gymnasts people like that that do a lot of high volume body weight training with short rest so we're kind of combining all three to create like a um, you know sort of an anabolic fast twitch overload here's what i'm saying so th what we're doing here is we, obviously we, we're doing a loaded movement here first then immediately follow a sprint right after So you've heard of the post-activation potentiation. We've talked about that before. That's where you, that's where it's like a pre-contraction um, basically assists 
the next contraction. So you can do like if you do movement A, it helps movement B become more powerful. Think isometric, you know, on the deadlift, pulling as hard as you can against the rack, wait a few minutes, you're more explosive on the subsequent deadlift set. So we have that area, but obviously doing fully utilizing that, you need a full recovery. We're not taking a full recovery here, so we're taking advantage of the shorter rest periods. So we are by not taking recovery from loaded movement to sprint, we're almost like the bodybuilding concept of pre-exhaust or pre-fatigued of the fast switch muscles but by doing this we're overloading the entire continuum the ones that are at you know we're activating them with the with the heavy movement first then we're then we're activating them also with a very fast sprint right after realizing we're sacrificing some of that for a little bit of that sprint by not taking a recovery so we'll do that do a loaded movement break immediately into the sprint here so we were gonna go 40 yards but we had to go 20 yards because of the conditions today rained here last night and um we could normally take to be full on recover between sets, probably take like five, you know, five minutes or so, take a long time to recover in between sets, but we're taking two minute breaks today. So we are getting recovery between sets, but not a full on recovery. So by those shorter rest periods, what happens before I made that comment about, we want you, you know, we want you waking up the right kind of stiff, pitching a tent in the morning, that kind of thing. That's because of the anabolic environment we're creating. With that anabolic environment, by the shorter rest periods, we're maximizing growth hormone and testosterone production. Okay, and there has in the research been some people questioning how much that hormonal response to exercise aids in the anabolic strength process. Okay, fair enough. However, I will go and say this. Okay, if it doesn't help, does it hurt? You know, so it may say, let's say it doesn't help as much as previously thought. We sure as hell know it ain't hurting. Furthermore, by doing these shorter rests, we do definitely get some conditioning out of this. So what we're doing here is basically doing, um, you're doing a set of anywhere from like four to eight reps, okay? Then you're gonna immediately sprint about 40 yards after. So I'm working on perfecting this kind of system here. And as we come, we develop more things, we'll, we'll have more to, to share with you here. But that's the idea, you do a heavy loaded movement and you sprint right after. And how was this inspired? This was originally inspired by a legendary Canadian sprinter, Ben Johnson. There was, he one time was squatting 505 reps, racked the bar, sprinted out of the squat rack 60 yards. And, um, you know, the, one of the, tra trained under the legendary Charlie Francis. So that's how this whole thing was inspired. Physique wise, how does this help you? We, you the performance benefits are ob obvious. It's called myogenic tone. That's when you're, that's, so you look at like a Branch Warren or Ronnie Coleman. They have a quote unquote dense look, Dorian Yates, a dense look. What does that mean? That's myogenic tones. That means their muscles are like a sort of a part, like partially activated at all time. Because the fast switch muscle fiber studies show are more superficial. They're more towards the skin. So if your nervous system is partially activated, it's like they're popping out at all time. That's that's built with fast twitch muscle fibers. That's done with heavy weight. So that's why Dorian Yates, Branch Warren look different. You can tell they're not fluffer bodybuilders just sit, sit around, pump 50 reps on a chrome machine take a bunch of drugs to go home. They're, they're building it with real lifting. So that, then even like a power lifter dieted down, a sprinter, look at it, like they're always, like they walk around, it's like they're always activated. So you can, it's gonna, if you're training for aesthetics, you can get that myogenic tone, walking around like always something's activated. It's more dense, more nasty, more grainy, you're gonna look better on the stage. So today, what we did, we did the throws overhead. We did the lunges with a sandbag, okay? Um, they'd be fine with a barbell too. Got this 200 pound sandbag. Just brought it out here because of, um, I didn't have my squat racks, not portable to bring out here. I, the one I have is portable to California. So he brought the sandbag, did it with that. And then we did the swings. Okay, the swings are, um, that's, I mean, I wish it was a little, wish it wasn't so wide, but it works for, for what we're, we're not getting ready for a kettlebell contest so we can live with it. So what you do here, you know, the swing, extend the glutes as hard as you can. It's one of the best ways to work your glutes. I feel like I have buns of steel right now after completing this uh, session today. So we did four sets of um, throws. We did four sets of swings, four sets of lunches, each coupled with a 20 yard sprint, resting two minutes between each. And um, I don't feel great today. So thanks for tuning in and we will have more to come.